tonight is our third uh, Dean's Huddle, and thank you for uh, letting us delay delay for a week. Uh, both Connor and I were I've been quite busy on what we kind of wanted to do, and so we um, uh, we delayed for one week. So this is our third one. It's our second one that's a very kind of tactical one. And the first one seemed to be well received. The second one was more of a topical area, which wasn't as it was still did okay, but wasn't as as viewed as much. So we're uh, we're kind of going to kind of refocus a little bit on those kind of things going forward. So that's tonight, and it's really about industry based research. And so the, I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then we're going to have um, John Hutchinson, who's our librarian, join us for about a seven minute talk that he's pre recorded. Uh, that we're going to play tonight and uh and we john it's not about academic research it's not about peer reviewed it's about figuring out stuff about companies about industries you know those things that we all struggle to find that are a lot tougher to get so how big is an industry growing how many staff does that company have you're building a competitor analysis for your boss your boss asks you to investigate an investment in some particular area how do you go about finding that when it's really freaking hard and so we're going to give you some tactics around that on January 16th, we're going to get into really, and this is an ever-evolving one. We've got a draft. We keep adding to it. What's going to, what do we really need to be aware of coming out of COVID if the bloody thing ever does end? But uh, it, it's really changed the world. Uh, I gave us a, a keynote, or I'm giving a keynote to the CPA Society of Maine uh, in a couple of weeks. And the idea is we'll base it and keep building from that on that exact topic. And then on the 27th, we're going to really dig into revenue generation resources. So a lot of you have been in situations like I have in my life often where you're asked to bring in more money, right? And so how can you do that? What are some tips and tactics? A lot of you know them. The idea is maybe we can build out some new ones or provide some new things that you can do. So tonight, we're going to go relatively quickly. As I said, that's the hope to give you most of your Sunday night back. And for those of you that are watching or listening afterwards, that you can do it in a, in a concise manner. Um, so I'm going to give a quick introduction and in, uh, what's going on around the Graduate School of Business and the MBA program, then right into my talk, then to John's talk. Then, as Connor said, we'll have an open Q&A that will be recorded kind of on the topic. Then we'll go in camera if anybody wants, i.e. means we're not going to be recording anymore. So if you want to ask any questions of either of us or the program or anything like that, we can do that afterwards. But that will not be recorded or shared. All right, so uh, I want a quick couple of quick updates. So I've been on the job now for almost five months. It seems like yesterday, but it's it's going very, very fast um, and, uh, and, and very good, I think. Uh, a lot of action happening. And so as you know, the Graduate School of Business is planning to move. Well, actually we are for sure now. The university system has taken over a lease of this particular property. For those that know Portland or in the Portland area, it's right a uh, stone's throw if you're a good thrower from the ocean. You can see the ocean from the top floors, and, and there's alumni behind this. There's the system behind it. The law school's moving in. We're moving in. There's an, an organization called Mises, which is a, very similar to the Graduate School of Business, a partnership between UMaine and University of Southern Maine around engineering, just like we are around graduate business, all graduate engineering programming. The law school, as I mentioned, is the primary attendant. The Portland Gateway, which is to drive um, industry-based research from the Portland research or the Orono researchers into Portland and a number of other entities around the university system. So very exciting, it's happening, likely moving next summer. Uh, the renovations and all those things are starting, but we're using the building a little bit already. So it's gonna be great. Very, very excited about that. Our enrollments are uh, the highest they've ever been. So a lot of you are in class right now, you're probably noticing your classes are pretty big, unless you're into the concentration courses or the very specialized courses at the end. We've had a really significant growth in the last two years. Um, still looking very, even as people say, hey, is that because of COVID? Well, part of it was, but our, our fall 22 projections are also based on the inbound we have already also really high. And we're, this is without a lot of marketing, which we're planning to launch shortly. We've got a marketing agency we're working with to how to position ourselves out of state and really get our messaging across. So very, very exciting growth and hopefully continued growth kind of as we go, go forward. We're doing okay in terms of uh, male female ratio. That's better than a lot of MBA programs, but certainly not 50-50 as we'd like to see. And we're doing pretty well out of state with about three in 10 students coming from outside of Maine. Here's a little map of some of that background. A lot of you know this because you're in the classes, but there's a there's a there's quite a senior base of students. We do have a, a cohort. It's kind of, there's two groups. There's a cohort of 
kind of four plus one people that have come very smart that have come right out of their undergrads or one year of experience that are looking to build and then a much larger cohort of those that average age gets you close to 40 very experienced VPs, directors, great backgrounds, entrepreneurs that want upward mobility, promotions at work, industry switchers, these kind of groups. So really an exceptional uh, student base and the feedback I've been getting from the professors so far is that that is in fact true. Nice diverse group in terms of countries and states. And as we mentioned, in terms of gender, not as much as we like kind of in terms of people of color, but something we're working on and getting a little bit better. Um, yeah, so that was a little bit of background on the uh, MBA, very short and sweet. So now into the topic for this evening, which is industry research tips. And so the idea here is, as I kind of set up front, is your task. So think less about a course and think about, you know, those of you that do consulting. I do some consulting. You do consulting work. You work for uh, your, your organization. You work for an agency. You're an agency working for an organization. And you got to get information. You don't have a huge budget to do it. And you don't have a lot of time. Connor and I are working on some big research projects right now. And we both know that that's the biggest thing that we face is time. It takes a lot of time to get money, a lot of time to get approvals, a lot of time to collect data, a lot of time to deal with privacy issues, a lot of time to deal with ethics. You go down the list, it takes a very long time. So how can you get data quickly that you can use to make decisions? And so one of the key things that we think about in industry-based research is the rigor, right? So what we try to publish in an academic journal or what you'd maybe submit to a final paper in a course, you would have a very, very rigorous lens. That level, that standard goes down in a decision-making situation, right? When your boss wants an answer by Friday or your client wants an answer before Christmas or whatever the case may be, and you're like, okay, I can't do this perfectly. There's no way I can get representative sample. Organizations don't share, as you know. I mean, my, my core area of work for many years in my PhD thesis is in sponsorship evaluation. Are big Fortune 500 brands doing very sophisticated research on that? Absolutely. Do they share it without making you sign away your life for one of your children? No. So you just it's just not out there. So unless you work for these organizations, you've never seen it. And if you have worked for them or you're an agency working for them, you're not allowed to share it with anyone else. You're going to be in big trouble with some very, very tough lawyers. And so you're in this kind of situation that how do we make a decision? How do I look smart to my boss or my client based on research that I want to do and what I can get, afford, get for it? So really think about this decision-making lens versus a perfect data lens. And so that you, that'll make more sense as we kind of go forward. And a lot of you probably know this as we go from there. And so there's a number of kind of tools and things we think about when we're looking at it, right? So you may have some research around customers, so people. And this used to be very easy to get. It's getting with the privacy legislations much, much harder, and rightly so. We ne don't necessarily want people to know about us, what we do, how we behave. I mean, we've been doing some stuff, and some of you in the marketing class have, I think, seen some of this stuff around what you know, tech providers of Wi-Fi and venues are able to see, whether it's an airport, a subway, a sports arena, et cetera, a mall. When you click onto that Wi-Fi, people get data about you, your background, what websites you've visited. They may not know who you are legally. They're not supposed to, but there's ways to find that out. So there's, that's generally being closed. You can't just go on and Google. We have census data from the US government or other governments around the world that we can use. Uh, to make these kind of decisions and, and help inform customer data. So we'll get into more of that. Company level data. So data about industries and organizations and competitors. Everybody's got competitors, as you all know, or at least substitutes that could replace them. So you're working for an upstart beverage company. How do you figure out what Coke or Pepsi or any of their subsidiaries are planning? What about other startups that could come along? You've all seen Porter's Five Forces. You see some of the stuff there. Competition, as is, is I just talked about. And the last one is an acronym we like to call PEST. You've probably heard about these things. But these are those non-controllable external, external things that we like to share with clients or bosses. So what's happening politically? We just had a change of government, right? So we, we've switched to a Democratic government from a Republican government. What does that mean? Well, that has some shifts in terms of policy, some shifts in terms of how the country thinks. You're going to operate or start a venture in a different way with a different government. You go down to the state level, you go down to the local level, et cetera, it's gonna have some influence. Economic, so what's happening economically? We're talking a lot about this right now. There's this incredibly low unemployment rate, people exiting the workforce because they just don't wanna work anymore. 
low interest rates, low inflation rates. Like these are really strange times, but a great time to launch an enterprise because you can borrow money really easy and your risk is relatively low as long as inflation stays low. And so it's an interesting timing. If you if you go back and I've been, when I first bought my first house and the mortgage was much closer to 10% than it was today, that was not a good time to start a business, you know? Turn of the century was really tricky. And so there's a lot of different factors. What about exchange rates if you're a global business? You know, all these things. Societal factors or demographic factors. And this is a massive shift that we're seeing. You think about women in the workforce or women out backing out of the workforce or senior jobs because of COVID, a really negative a thing that's kind of happened in the last 18 months. You probably know this stat, but 2015 was the first year in the history of the United States that more babies were born who were not non-Hispanic white than were. And so we're seeing a massive shift. So you, literally 10 years from now, when you're looking at high schools, more kids across the country will be what we used to call minorities than the white majority. So really massive shifts happening across the board. And we can keep going on down the list of what's going to happen there. So you have to have your finger on top of that. And then technology, what's going on out there in terms of, of, uh, of what are the next advances in your particular area? Think of how like Zoom now is common practice. We couldn't have done this with much success three years ago. It wasn't even possible six years ago. What's the next kind of iterations and how are we going to do these kind of things? And are we all going to be, you know, what's coming? So you have to be on top of that based on your industry and where it goes. So it gives you a bit of a frame. All of a sudden you're probably thinking, wow, there's a whole pile of variables, a whole bunch of data I can get here. There's think tanks, there's government sources, there's people I know. And I'll get into that in a second. But all of a sudden you start to put a lens around stuff you want to do. This is a, a bit textbooky-ish, but I'll explain it quickly. And it really helps me when I'm doing a consulting project. When you think about what's your challenge. So let's say you're asked to explore some brand new business in a brand new topic area. So you want to do a subsidiary of a blockchain company in a digital environment. Holy cow, there's nothing out there. That's exploratory. You're going to get out there. You're going to try to figure out what's happening. You're going to ask people what might happen down the road. Let's say you're asked to, to launch a new restaurant, seafood restaurant in downtown Portland, right? There's lots of them. Some fail, some are successful. That's clearly very descriptive research, right? Let's go in there. Let's see what the other restaurants offer. Who went bankrupt? Who's doing well? Let's stand out front, do some observation. Who's got a line on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night? Who's empty, et cetera. Like let's do, get their menus, look at their prices. Doing. We can describe in detail how that might want to work. And then even more closely, we have explanatory research. So if you have a, some relationship between a couple of variables we want to we want to look at. So let's say, for instance, you're working for the state of Maine and they ask you to develop a program that's going to support female entrepreneurs. Success of a business, female, female owners, female investors, boom. You can start getting some data and do some relationships, compare it to male owners and success rates. You can explain it. So you figure out your, your question up front, and this will send you in the direction that you kind of want to go. I, I think I explained the blog. There's two slides there when you want to read them afterwards, but it's essentially covering what I just said. Then your sources of data. Okay, so now I know what I want to do. I got some variables I want to look at. Where do I go? Well, you know all this, but just to say it quickly, there's two sources out there. There's primary data you get yourself. You interview somebody, you survey somebody, you analyze something. Secondary data is data that was done by somebody else that you grab. A census report, an industry report by McKinsey, a report by Bank of America on their sponsorship investments, a housing shortage report by the government. Whatever the case may be, you grab it from somewhere else. If you do deeper analysis on the secondary research, then it becomes primary research. So primary really is referring to things that you do. Do bosses and clients love primary research? Yes, right? So if you ever have a chance to do it, it's always better. Why don't we always do it? Way more expensive, much harder to do, takes a pile of time. So what do we try to do in these tight situations? We always try to find secondary date research first. Has somebody already done what I need to find out to inform that decision? Plus you get the credibility if it's a good source of going from there. And then it can inform what you might want to do with a primary research. I'll give you some tactics kind of in a second. So this kind of shows a, a little bit overall of how these things can fit together. And so there's primary research, there's secondary research, and there's a bunch of methodologies. And you, so you know this, you can say, okay, do I have the ability, the knowledge, the background, the expertise to do quantitative research? It's obviously ideal to have data to analyze, but hard to get 
Is my sample representative? Can I put hands on it? What can I do? Qualitative research, a little softer, but a little easier to get. Can I interview a few key people? Do I have a former professor who's an expert in the area, a former boss who's an expert in the area who might give me 30 minutes of their time for an anonymous interview? Could I talk to these kind of different kind of people and, and see what, what can kind of happen in that kind of respect, right? And so you think about all of those things that kind of fit together. And then under the research strategy block there, the third one down, you know surveys. Experiments is something you may not be quite as aware of. And this is where you do something where you will control for a number of variables and assume everything else is different. So let's say you're working for an ad agency and you wanna see if having a lower price for your product will work, right? And so maybe you pick a certain market or a certain store of your client and you're gonna offer a different price point. Let's say that client happens to be a series of 10 kilometer runs across New England. Well, let's take five of them and we're gonna price our 10K at $59. And we'll take another five, we'll price it at $79. And then we'll assess them, we'll analyze them, assume everything else is equal, we're not sure it is, and see did that drive our satisfaction, our numbers, our volume, our profitability. It's a bit of an experiment, just like you do in a lab with titrations and chemistry. And then you can kind of build from there. That's one that you may want to add to your toolkit. If you're interested, we've got a lot of papers and stuff about how to do them, happy to share. When you get into the, the qualitative stuff, you have a lot of choices. So a lot of people immediately think about all I can do is kind of interviews, right? And interviews are great if you have experts. So I would think about only expert interviews. So if you go in front of a client and say, hey, I interviewed three of my buddies, not going to hold a lot of water. Hey, I interviewed three former vice presidents from tech firms. Oh, wait a minute. That, it could be one former vice president of a tech firm. That could be enough to help you make your decision because they are an expert. In lack of an expert, you start digging into other things. So focus groups is a very good one. We get a group of people together to discuss it. A case study. Is there some organization out there that you know about, have some context to, maybe you can grab a Harvard or Stanford case on that company that's published through the library system. Build some detail, some background on things that we want to look at. Document analysis. One great tool that I've used a lot is you go across companies and you grab their annual reports. Yeah, get their financials, compare 10 competitors in that space, see what they're doing, see how they're spending, see what their strategic frameworks are, make some comparisons, gives you some interesting things. You may have heard of ethnography or netnography. Ethnography is famous for like in kind of biology and anthropology studies where someone will go live with a den of wolves or to see how wolves behave. Well, we're not interested in wolves, but maybe you go and you join an organization for a while. You can go onto their their chat rooms or their discussion boards or their podcasts or their, their social media sites, see what people are saying about them, their Twitter feeds, and actually do some analysis of what I think customers are thinking about that company or its products and do some interesting things. We did a big project with that with Nokia a number of years ago, really learned a ton about their views of a new product they launched and allowed them to make some changes. So there's some cool things you can kind of do. And then on the far right, there is this idea of mixed methods, sequential methods, Anytime you have multiple methods, it's very strong and clients really like that. A term we often call this triangulation, right? Multiple ways to look at the same thing. Very, very effective with clients and bosses, right? As you think about going forward there. Um, in terms of these, these, how you kind of do these, and obviously we're not going to get too much into that in, in a quick kind of talk tonight, but there's a couple of things that are that are important to think about when you think about interviews that can be focus groups or other methods that we might use i'll point out quickly the delphi method that's there is an interesting one that's used this is essentially a focus group where you you force maybe a strong word but you encourage the participants to come to consensus so you might so beer companies famously do this right they'll have a group of nine people who they're big drinkers of their brand so here's our new packaging here's three options figure out which one you all agree with. And once you come out with a unanimous answer, we'll give you all a free six pack, right? So that kind of notion, you kind of force people to make a decision, getting them to kind of do things for it. Then you can use online types of questions. There's piles of different things you can do. Audio, video, you can have people send you quick notes by email. So it's very hard to nail people down as you all know, being busy people, but can you get little blurbs, little fourth sources of data that might help you get to where you want to do? So how do you choose from all this stuff that I'm, I'm kind of talking about? Well, it goes back to a couple of core questions which you've already kind of talked about, but I'll just kind of frame them here if you think about, okay, quickly, how do I do this? What are you trying to accomplish? Am I exploring something? Am I describing something? 
Am I looking from some kind of correlation between variables? Is it something that's new? Is it something that's established? Is it something that has very clear relationships that I can look at? What sources of data are available to me? So my research approach, what are the questions that I want to look at? And then what strategy, mixed, qualitative, quantitative, secondary, primary, what works within the budget and the time frame that I have? And then how can I go out and get that data? So for instance, let's say you're trying to evaluate the effectiveness of the sponsorship of a music festival. In your dream world, you would spend $100,000 with a market research agency and do a big study of everybody in the area. You may only have $500. You get 10 brand ambassadors to spend three hours each with iPads, you know, interviewing people that are at the concert to get their feedback and everything kind of in between. So you've always got tools, even if they're not perfect at the end of the day. And here's just a couple of, uh, of questions that, that I like to go through and think about when you're looking at what, what one of these tools and ideas that do you, do you want to do? Can you actually get access to them? What methods you might be able to do? do? Can you get primary data or do we have to use secondary? Is there any secondary data in this field? What about the ethical issues I might have to deal with with a company? So that's one big thing that we often run up against is unless someone is a president or a CEO, very, very low chance that they're going to be able to share the data or even come on and do an interview where a CEO or president can usually do what they want. An owner of a firm can do what they want. And so those personal relationships can help provided they're able to do it. And a lot of big organizations now in their employment contracts, they don't allow people to even talk about this stuff. So it's very hard to recruit and down the list you go, can you use anonymous techniques to get people to join, et cetera. So a bunch of questions there that you can think about to how you use it. If you end up getting in the situation where it is consumer data, and you're able and you want to kind of access it in, in a challenging way, there are a pile of really interesting uh, techniques out there and softwares. One not, not on this list that we use a lot is called Leximancer, which allows you to look at Twitter feeds and draw them. So for instance, we did a study, it's published if anyone wants to see it, around what all the shoe brands, Nike, Adidas, Reebok, Puma, Brooks, et cetera, did around the last World Cup, FIFA World Cup. And so like, what are they doing in the social media space? We know clearly one of them is the official sponsor in the real world, but in the social media world, it's kind of, you know, it's the wild west. People can kind of do what they want, so to speak. How do you go get that data? There's lots of interesting things out there. And I mean, this is just here. So you kind of have it. Any one of these are interesting tools. You can use some of them. The company can share them with you. So one thing, if you work with organizations, they'll have Google analytics and Facebook analytics behind the scene. Others, you're just scraping the internet for, the data that's available. Just to give you the idea of how powerful um, these things are. Like with NCAPTURE, for instance, let's say you're doing a study on, on what on professional NBA players and how much they're paid and you want to do an analysis of, uh, of the performance versus their salaries, you can relatively quickly scrape the data from every player who ever played, because NBA reference.com, grab their salary, plug it into a giant spreadsheet with hundreds of thousands of rows. We've done this and then analyze it. Is the data perfect? Do you trust it? Well, maybe, maybe not. Is it from a reasonable source? Yes, but it's something you can do it. So if you think about academic publishing, it's hard. You think about that decision-making lens, away you go. You can pull data from stock markets, from annual reports, et cetera, and not actually have to enter it hand by hand. And so there's a bunch of things out there. There's other ones. This gives you an idea of some of the ones you might want to use or might want to look at. And you'll obviously have this, this slide deck to kind of go forward. When you think about something where you're trying to sample, there's a couple of important things to think about. And so you think, who's my population of interest? Potential customers for my new seafood restaurant in downtown Portland. So you may say, well, we're a luxury restaurant. So you may do a little analysis of, of census data and say, hey, we think there's about 20,000 people in, uh, in the Portland area who would regularly attend restaurants where they would spend $100 or more for dinner for two, right? Maybe you come up with that kind of metric. Okay. So those 20,000 people, how do I get a few of them to see what they want, what they think of other offerings? Would they come to my restaurant? What should we emphasize? What kind of chef should we hire? What should our menu look like? Where should our location be? What should our tables look like? What should the decor look like? What kind of music should we play? I keep going on, right? There's a zillion things when you run a restaurant. So how many do I need to know? Well, it's not, there, there's, as you've all know from your stats class, there's a couple estimators out there, but there's no perfect thing. Some say you need at least 150 to do detailed analysis. If you could get eight of them, these couples to come and talk to you in a, in a focus group setting, would that be enough? Maybe. But if you're making a decision, it's not. Do, do, if I do a survey, 
how many can I get? So is eight people enough for a survey? Absolutely not. Could eight people be enough for a deep interview or a focus group? Maybe. What about 50? So you, you, you have this function of the number available, the technique that I'm going to use, and you're only going to get into surveys and that kind of data analysis or little, like little social media grabs, which wouldn't work for this problem unless you get to a sufficient size to go from there. So that, that's a really important thing to think about. The last point on this slide is very key. And so if you're ever doing interviews or focus groups, qualitative research, you only stop when you hit what we call saturation. So let's say you're interviewing potential customers for this new seafood restaurant and you start working your way through. When you get to your 17th interview and you've learned nothing new, maybe you do one more and then, okay, I'm at saturation. I'm not learning anything new from these people. I'm good. So it's not a sample size issue. It's called saturation, which is a really neat thing to do. And sometimes in some issues, you might only have to do five. Really depends on how it kind of works. This is my last slide before I turn it over to our, our librarian. Just some other little tips that I've used along, along my career, which you may find helpful. A really neat one is the first one, buy a share. So let's say, for instance, you want to learn more about Nike. You can go buy one Nike share. Now, I think it's about $200. I've done this in the past. You can buy a share, and then all of a sudden you're a shareholder. Sure, you'll, you own one 177 millionth of the company, but you're going to get an annual report. You're going to get the details. You're going to get the shareholder information. You're going to learn a lot. It's a neat little technique you can use to buy different things. The second one is the stock exchanges. Is, is These are great sources that we often underestimate. So if an organization is publicly traded on any of the major stock exchanges anywhere in the world, they have to agree to disclose a certain amount of information because obviously people want to know enough whether they should buy or sell those shares in a fair and open and transparent way. There's a lot of regulations, as you know. So that's a great place to look. You can do event studies. Did certain things happen? They launched a new product. Did the share price go up? What kind of reporting do they have? Do they, did their employee size grow or shrink during COVID? A whole bunch of different things you can look at. NAICS, some of you may have heard of this, the North American Industry Classification System. So when Canada, the US, and Mexico kind of joined forces with the free trade agreement in the 80s, this was created. And it's kind of a joint by the three governments. And they probably, it takes a little while to get up to date data, but every industry has a code. And like, so the, the, there's, there's like a seven digit number down to a certain industry in a certain region in a certain country, and it works its way up. Our library has access to it. You can find a lot of those things online. And if you want to learn about the electrical engineering industry in North America, or you want to nail it down to just the Southern United States, this will allow you to do, and it's got pretty basic things. Like, is it growing or shrinking? How many people work in it? What are the average salaries, et cetera? What are some of the issues? We can get a little bit of a snapshot of where they go. And the other, the next two, I think you know pretty well, companies that are publicly traded and most others, any that are not for profit or or 413Cs, they have to publish annual reports. You can grab those. Industry analyses, a lot of agencies. I mentioned a few earlier, like the McKinsey's of the world, et cetera. They, in order, part of their marketing tactics, they, they share industry analyses that they do. You can get some really cool things. Sometimes it takes a little while to dig, but you can get them. Sometimes you have to pay a little bit for them, but they're out there. Look at your competitor's annual reports, which is the one above, but very specific on your competition and what they're doing. I mentioned the expert interview up front, but just to kind of go back to that again, if you've got nothing else, nothing else, and you're, oh my God, my boss wants to know, find an expert somewhere, someone you can position as an expert. Like I said, a former professor, a former colleague, someone who can give you some deeper insights and, hey, should we do this or not? Or B, what, what, what color should this be? Or whatever the question might be for your particular challenge, get in there. The second last one there is one I wanted to just kind of take a second on. And so comparable case study. So this is an interesting one. So I'll give you one example. A lot of my, my life, as you know, is in sport business. We were doing some work with the Ottawa Senators, an NHL hockey team. They're the only major pro sport in that city. It's the capital city of Canada, about a million people. Uh, like, what the heck do you do? Like, is there any other city? And so we started really looking around. And nowhere we found the best com comparable was a, a city called Canberra, Australia. And their their AFL rugby team in um, in Australia. So it's the capital of Australia. It's the third biggest city behind two much bigger cities. It's a government town. Lot of blah 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 blah. And so it was a really neat comparison. And then we learned a ton from the activities that that club was doing, which were much more advanced. 
but it was in a comparable thing. So don't just be limited by borders or leagues or industries or sub industries. Start looking around for comparables in other places that might actually you might actually learn a lot from. So what cities have similar size populations around the world that you want to operate in, or what, et cetera, what kind of has similar income levels or whatever the, the case may be, you might want to dig into. And then the last one is sometimes it's very old fashioned, but sometimes you just pick up that telephone thing and try to make a couple of calls when you're trying to get these kind of things about. So those were kind of some of my tips to kind of go forward. So hopefully, Connor, that was quick enough and, and useful in terms of things that people can do. And we'll now go in to John, who's going to talk for a few minutes, and then we will follow up with uh, a few questions. I'm John Hutchinson, and I'm here today to show you how to use library resources to find industry profiles. Right from here on the library webpage, if you go to databases, I'm going to show you two databases today. One is called Ibis World, one is called Statista. So with that in mind, we can go to the business section, go to Ibis World. After a moment, it'll come up. And here we are. Ibis World is um, a specialized database, really. Um, Ibis World is only about industry profiles. This is their specialty. As you can see, it has some recently reviewed viewed reports along the bottom there. But I'm going to do a search today. My topic of choice is mattress manufacturing. So if you pull up mattress manufacturing, you notice I typed in, start, I started to type in mattress. And it came up mattress manufacturing in the U.S. I'm going to click on that. It's mat mattress manufacturing in the U.S. And as you can see, it gets amazingly detailed. It has some headings out to the side here, industry at a glance, industry performance, industry outlook. What I like, what I like and what uh, patrons like, students like about IBIS is that right up top, it has a supply chain. Supply chain is um, a very much discussed topic these days because America's supply chain has slowed down so much in recent years because of the COVID epidemic. But it shows the key external drivers, uh, disposable income, demand, value of residential construction, e-commerce sales, but also it gives you the supply chain in terms of who a mattress manufacturer buys from for cardboard boxes, urethane foam, textiles, wire and spring, and who they sell to, furniture stores, warehouse clubs, department stores, hospitals, and hotels and motels. The industry at a glance is also very detailed. Here it comes. Gives you these statistics, gives you a SWOT report. This is all authored by the folks at Ibis World. Gives you the market share of the major players, Temper Sealy, Sura, Sleep Number, Casper Sleep, and it gives you profiles of the major players. Among, among many other things. Uh, this is a brief presentation today, so I don't really have the time to walk you through the, through all this, but Ibis World is a very valuable resource for industry profiling, but it's not the only one. Allow me to go over to the databases again. I'll show you another one called Statista. Click on Statista. Now, the one I just showed you, Ibis World, they author all their own stuff. Uh, everything you see in Ibis World is going to be authored by the folks at Ibis World. Satista is a little different. Satista does offer its own products, but it also uh, draws in statistical reports from all over the web for both private and pro public, uh, public sources. But I'm going to do the same kind of search. And here we go. have a good mix of things like statistics, forecasts and surveys, infographics, um, and that would be drawn from other elsewhere on the web. But the thing to look for in terms of detailed industry profiling is these dossiers. And here we have the dossier mattress retailing in the United States. As you can see, it's in a little different format. It's a straight PDF document. It's 65 pages long. As you can see, if you did not have access to Statista through an institutional subscription like we do, this would cost you about $500. But we subscribe, and so I'll bring up the report. Statista is all about stats, as the name suggests, but it's also about info, uh, infographic, graphically portrayed statistics, and that way they really favor bar graphs, 
betting sales are the line graph of betting industry quarterly sales in the United States from 2012 to 2020 in billions. There's a retail market, all very detailed. And they have these dossiers on hundreds of different industries, which can really be a help. It's also keeping an eye on the time here. I don't want to go over my allotted time. I'm going to go back to Folklore Library and show you one, a, 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 another source of industry profiles called ProQuest One Business. <clears throat> now, ProQuest One is a far ranging product. Um, you can look for scholarly journals and company reports and newspapers on ProQuest One, but you can also look for industry and country reports. I'll put it in mattress, mattress manufacturing. Like I did the other ones. There's an there's an entry for industry reports, and there it is. Um, the most recent one, 2020 U.S. Mattress Manufacturing Industry and Market Report. It's full text in PDF format. Here it is. Now this is very lengthy, with many many sections of information, both longitudinal and uh, current snapshot of the mattress manufacturing industry in the United, in the United States. I want to make clear that um, these industry reports on Statista and Ibis World and ProQuest One are not just for the manufacturing industries. It would be for the service industries as well. Uh, so you shouldn't be shy about trying to find things about sports agents, for example, um, or lawyers or uh, law firms or any other kind of service industry that's not to do with manufacturing. And let's leave the databases for a moment as I give you a fourth and last option for industry reports. Let's just go to Google. I'm going to search the, uh, the wide, wide web here. And it's best if you want to get the most complete picture of, in, of an industry, look for a trade association. And I'm going to just type in mattress manufacturers trade association. And the first hit is something called sleep products and the International Sleep Products Association, a united outspoken voice for the mattress industry. And a good trade association should have a section for resources for statistics and consumer research and things like that and publications. The statistics here, here are statistics straight from the industry itself. Um, so you can use Ibis World, Statista, and ProQuest One to get outside analysis, but here's where you go to actually get it straight from the people who sell mattresses themselves. Um, so you can look for, um, uh, no matter how obscure or niche your industry is, you should never assume that the, well, there's so few of them that can't possibly be an industry association for it. Go to Google. Type in your industry, put the word associated association in there, and then just do site colon dot org to limit to org. And um, you're likely to find a trade association. I hope this, was, hope this has been helpful. Um, if you have any uh, questions, you can always contact me, john.hutchinson at main.edu. I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you like this presentation. Big thank you to John. I'm John Hutchinson. There we go. Next one. So um, John is very open. We're very lucky to have a librarian that's dedicated to the, the business school. We also have librarians that are dedicated to the Graduate School of Business at the University of Southern Maine. So if you're on that campus, they're also available and happy to share the contact information as well. Um, and very fortunate. Hopefully you saw there and probably a lot of you know some of that stuff, but we do have a significant number of resources at our fingertips. I can tell you I have a lot of agency friends that wish they had a Statista subscription because it is very expensive. Unfortunately, the university um, university has it. So don't forget those tools that you have just because you have a main.edu uh, email account. It's very, very fortunate. Um, so I would open it up now if there's any questions that people have. You can certainly contact Connor, myself, or John on any of these topics. And I know Connor will be posting uh, the presentation uh, afterwards. So if you didn't have, if you want to see some of the lists of things or things we shared, that'll certainly be available.
It's uh, more around your work with the senators. I'm a hockey fan myself. So I, uh, and they, they haven't been very good of late. I mean, they're, they're better now they're coming out of their rebuild, but more interested in the land. I didn't know Ottawa and greater Ottawa area had a million people. Cause I always call it a small market and I'm from Calgary. I'm a flames fan within the province of Alberta. You're competing with two teams. So you're not like in, so I would say Ottawa has a similar market to Calgary, but Ottawa always ranks lower in attendance. Why? Like, did you, I guess, did you come across that? And what did you find out about the AFL team? What did they do that was cool? I guess, two part question. Yeah. Thanks Thomas very much. And I mean, I'll, I'll frame it really much around the topic for today. So it's a, it's a good question. And I mean, Calgary, I think just passed Ottawa to be the fourth largest market in Canada. So it is of that kind of piece. So I've done tons of, pro- of projects with them. A lot of them are public, so I can certainly send them to you if you want. Um, the couple of the reasons why the attendance has been lower, uh, and this is one of the things we really got into with the impact studies we did for them, was the re- arena location. Canada, Ontario, beside a, a hockey or not a hockey, a car dealership. It's, yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of, they had visions when Ottawa was like the high tech capital of Canada back in the day, they had visions of it growing, but it just hasn't. Like San Jose has had that model and it's been successful. Anaheim's had that model, it's been successful, uh, but they just haven't had the growth out there. So it's really awkward for a fan to get out there. If you want to have a drink or a beer at the game, you don't want to sit in parking afterwards. So they've got free buses from the city and stuff, but it's a really, it's not a great experience to come out of a game and wait in line for a bus in the cold weather, get on the bus, wait in line on the bus, go home. By then it's people have lost all their room. So it's not very attractive unless the team is really good. So the team has been good. They've done okay. When the team's not as great as we pointed out. So a lot of the efforts have been to move to have a downtown arena. So that's some of the research we did around the impact of, of that particular um, that particular objective, which hasn't happened for them yet. There was an effort around the Breton Flats, you might know downtown that yeah. didn't happen. So, but, and then to your, to your question about the comparison um, with the rugby team in Canberra uh, was really around sponsorship uh, revenue generation in terms of sweet sales from corporations. And the main thing was in government towns, it'd be the same in Washington, DC, the um the corp there aren't many corporations and government entities are not allowed to buy corporate season ticket holders or buy a suite for customers those kind of things so those clubs really really structure so one of the things they did was to complete renovation to reduce the number of suites offered so it increased the supply versus to be more in line with the demand a number of plate and that's what had done that to build some kind of programs that were we're trying to draw on the fan bases from outside of town to potentially come in and do those things There's a lot of fans from other so sydney and melbourne and canberra toronto and montreal around ottawa so a lot of it was really at the marketing level a lot was learned because it really i mean like a lot of teams in canada as you know with calgary in the early days it was very easy you put a nhl sign up and the tickets were sold that's shifting, right? With some of these yeah. demographic trends we're talking about and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so it's a good example of, uh, of how you can use kind of a comparable agency to get some information to kind of solve a problem. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Anyone else have anything? Hopefully that yeah. was... Uh, but yeah, that covered my question. Um, thank you. Yeah. Any, anyone else? And we can, or we can... Uh, yeah, no, I think we had a question about privately held businesses and... Uh, research in that regard. Yeah, very challenging. And so I think, so if, the, if they're not publicly traded or if they're not a kind of a not-for-profit 501c, you're, you're kind of in trouble, right? In terms of initially finding public data. So then you want to start thinking about what are the other avenues to figure out that what that organization is doing. And so the first one as a tip I gave before, buy a share. Great thing to do if they're if they're if you can do that, even though if they're private, some of them you're not going to be allowed to do that. But they still have like some non-publicly traded organizations still have shareholders, right? So you can still do that. Second thing is get your hand on an, an industry report or an annual report of what they're kind of doing. As uh, John pointed out, the trade associations, which they're often members of, because of the lobbying pieces, particularly if it's somewhat of a controversial industry. So if you think about alcohol or soft drinks or oil companies that are always lobbying uh, governments. They're quite active with their trade associations and their lobby documents. You can probably get a few things that way. There's also some agencies that will specialize 
in, um, in different industries. So for instance, I mentioned oil, there's an agency, a big agency that, that, that's, I won't give their name. You can Google them and find them, but their whole, what they do is they go around to, um, to gas stations all over the place, thousands and thousands of observations. And they count cars that pull into gas stations to make an estimate of who's winning the market share battle. Then they sell that data back to the firms and they release some industry reports on it. So if you dig a little bit, you'll find a few things. It is freaking hard and you have to be diligent, but that's why we kind of wanted to have a session like this. So you can kind of get there a little bit quicker uh, when you're going to kind of do it. And then I think the last thing will be some of those other tips we kind of shared. Do you know someone who can give you a little bit of expertise from an, an external area? Can you get your hands on um, some kind of an industry report if you're trying to do it? If it's if it's something around investing in or customers, can you get them together to do something? And you say, well, how do I do Well, if you're with an agency or, or a, a university project that's got a little bit of funding, you can offer people you know, an Amazon gift card or a Starbucks meal or something to come join you. And often people are willing to chat, but that's really at the kind of the, uh, the customer level, but yeah, you need to be creative, but again, lower your expectations from, I need the perfect data because you're not going to get it. Do I need enough data to make a decision or to inform my boss that I would be comfortable with, Hey, this is not worth doing, or yes, we should investigate further. And here's why you have some evidence, not just your opinion. I think that's really key. More to the, the adding on to the private uh, discussion there with your background in sports industry, how hard is it to get sports industry data? Because outside of, as far as I know, the Green Bay Packers, North American sports, there's no publicly traded company. The Green Bay Packers are kind of publicly traded, but not really like they have shareholders, but it's more of a commemorative thing. Yeah. From the, so the pros, the, yeah, it's a great question. So the, the elite pro sports, well, and, and Forbes kind of does their, their estimates, but the Green Bay Packers tells us a wonderful story in the NFL because they share the centrally shared revenues, right? So you kind of know what everybody gets, mm -hmm. which is really neat. But the other leagues, no, Europe, the premier leagues, we've got uh, audited financials that Deloitte gives an executive summary, but if you pay about, I think it's a hundred pounds, you get full financials from all of the five premier leagues, which is pretty cool. I so didn't we, know often use, we often use a lot more of that for deeper analysis. Then you kind of just trust the Forbes data. Uh, that's the, the elite leagues, but the, the rest it's, it's, there's very, very little. And baseball's got kind of a firewall. They've got that special legislation that no one quite knows why they have it, but they must have had some friends in 1887 when they got, didn't have to share anything. I think the, uh, the owners of the teams were friends of the president or something, but there's something happened back then, but every other industry wish they had, it. but the next level down, we know very little too. Like think about the NLL or the AHL or the CHL or the arena football league or the WNBA. There, there's very limited disclosures there as well. So we just know that most of those teams aren't doing that well. And the players aren't that well paid. Um, Tennis and golf, there's pretty good data out there because the associations are essentially like unions of the athletes, right? So the ATP and the WTA, and so they really want that out there as they fight for their fair share of what they're doing. But you flipped others like UFC, and they don't uh, they don't share at all. And those athletes, by there's some lawsuits going on, as you may know, uh, they don't really get their fair share, not even close, because there's very limited disclosure. So it's really a it's quite a it's quite a game in terms of that kind of piece, and and we know that most of the athletes uh, aren't doing as uh, the other leagues aren't doing as well as maybe they could or we would like to see them do. So, but it, yeah, it's tricky, but enough you can do some research on. And we we've got pushed before on some of these academic articles we've published around the use of Forbes data. So we've kind of followed up with some you know friends who are involved with leagues or clubs, and they'll tell you that the data is wrong, but they'll tell you that the relative differences are are pretty bang on so for instance they may be off on the new york rangers total profitability but relative to the pittsburgh penguins it makes sense so if you're doing kind of longitudinal summary data they were willing to be quoted to say yeah yeah it's okay to do the analysis but if you're saying this is exactly what our uh, it's not it's not that accurate so it's it's good to do some analysis with it's the best we have but it's not perfect so, that's so a good in terms example of a analysis, do you mean like the Rangers are worth 50% more than the Penguins? Like something yeah. like that? Yeah, if you plug them all, you see you plug, like you, we've got data going back to 1990s. We've been grabbing it every year. So 1990s, you've got 
30, 31 years of data from, from across 30 teams, the whole thing, and you start to dig in and look at, you know, compare their winning and da, 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 across the leagues, and you find some inflection points in those models, that would make sense. So okay. yeah, it's kind of based on that notion that it's relative. I don't think they would agree quite as specific as you just said, but in that relative longer term thing, you can make some decisions on it. So then what we do is, and so yeah, it's again, it's really hard to publish academically but really useful if you want, let's say you had someone who said, hey, you had a client who said, hey, I'm interested in buying an NHL club, should I buy it? You'd have some data you could kind of play around with there and give them some insights from. Okay. Uh, and if you, then you can start throwing in population of the market, how, pop, how popular are they? Get some expert interviews, You all these things we kind of talked about, look at f- sizes of fan bases, wealth of the market, and you could pull together a bit of a model to at least make a, informed decision says no this doesn't make any sense to put an nhl team in wichita or whatever the the ask was right so i think you could you could do something that way so again that's really key right you're thinking about what my a plus in my finance class versus enough to decide what to invest in my, my extra 500 bucks in shares mm-hmm. two different levels of analysis obviously you would love to have the perfect analysis for your 500 bucks just not likely to be available but can you get enough insight so that you, you feel like you make a good decision at least you hedge that that decision is going to go in your favor is really the idea and that's where all those tools that we talked about and john talked about can come into play okay sweet thank you great question i know we're using sport as an example here but i think for all the others like really sub in any industry right you could sub in any industry in fact as he showed with mattresses i think a lot of other industries have a lot more information available that was a pretty neat uh, one that he used, right? Because it's a pretty blah. And look at the data that's available that you could use. If you want to start a mattress company, you could probably give a pretty good um, point of view on whether you, someone should do it or not, right? Based on what's out there. 